is going to take where we left off yesterday, and we're going to go into some of the details, the very important details about what we are doing in HR. Uh, just before we get started, though, assignment two is up here at the front for those of you that are handling paper. And the next one is going to be the assignment two. If you have any questions, please take them up in the very end. So, let's just put this in context where we're going here. Last time we were looking at Shua charts and the Gibson chart. And I had left off at the end of the class saying the Shua chart is a chart where we're really trying to monitor for the location of the process, in other words, in the process at time, within a certain bound. And we emphasize that the Shua chart has no memory. Every observation plotted on that chart is independent of the other one. The Qsim chart is totally the opposite. It has infinite memory all the way back to when you initiate the chart. So those cumulative sums build up, and whatever you're plotting at this time point is very much a function of the data that you have available at the previous time. The moving average chart, which we, we won't look at in detail, but simply illustrating conceptually, is one where you strike a little bit of a middle ground where you have a window of data and you shift that window over. So here's a window of five samples and I shift it over by another five and another five. And I take the average of those five raw data points and I plot the average x bar. And we ended up last class by showing what that formula looks like. So x bar is one over n, where n is the number of samples in the group multiplied by the raw data graph. So if n was four, that weight that you're applying to each raw data point is a four. So you're using the sample size of 1 to 10, it would be weights of 0 0.1, 0 0.1. So the larger the sample, the smaller the weight. And the thought I left with you last was to say, well, that might be a little bit unsatisfactory because we recognize our most recent data is of more importance to us. So can we have more weight on the most recent data with declining weights out in the history? And that's where we're going with today's derivation. So today's derivation is partly on the board and partly on the objective slides. So let's take a look then at EWMA, exponentially weighted moving average. So it's like the moving average, except we're going to use exponentially prime weights. With heavier weights for the most recent <coughs> So the derivation goes as follows. And the reason why I want to go through this is because, as I've said in a previous class, Graduates from this university get shortchanged, actually, at every university, because we don't teach any time series at the level. Time series analysis is phenomenally important to work with any data out in the industry. All the data we work with has a time-based relationship with it. So we need to at least be exposed to some time series analysis so that you can understand the data that you're dealing with. The EWMA, the reason why I'm focusing on it, is because it is the most important one step ahead predictor we have available to us. It's an optimal predictor for one step ahead predictions. It's very, very widely used in econ and metrics. So if any of you have done any of the business school stuff, you would have probably seen the exponentially weighted movement average as a smoother or as a predictor. And it's excellent for stock market predictions. It's excellent for chemical engineering projects. We don't emphasize that enough. Let's take a look at how it works. So if I've got my raw data at this current point in time, I'll call it x sub t. What the EWMA does is it tries to predict what x t is. So x hat, so my prediction on x is x t is equal to whatever my prediction was one step ago, t minus 1 x hat, plus this weight lambda with an error. So what is my error? My error is, well, error at the current time is whatever I've had on my process, so x, t, the actual value, minus the value I predicted. So if, without the hats, represents raw data, and with the hats is my prediction. And the subscript represents the point in time at which that's taking place. So what we have to do, though, is, as you can see, this is a recursive formula. My prediction of x at the current time is a function of the prediction at the previous time step. Okay, so this, there's a recursive relationship here. So we need some way to, to start off with our calculations. And our rule is to follow these three, oh, 
here. So let's say my prediction at my zero time step to start off my system is t the target. Okay, or in other words, there's another notation you use to x double bar. Whatever your target is where you want the process to be at is where you start off. Then at time zero, my error is zero. I've got no error at my Lambda, this weight that I'm going to interpret a little bit more next, is a value that ranges between 0 and 1. I'm going to look at how you can select lambda and what different group values of lambda mean. Now, a little bit more convenient, though, to work with is to actually shift this formula one step ahead. So right now, I'm looking at x hat at time t. Well, let's take a look at it in time one step ahead. So x hat t plus 1 is equal to x hat at t <coughs> plus lambda times an error at times t. Let's, it's more natural to work predicting one step ahead and say everything here on the left hand side is what I have available to me right now at time t. This is available to me in the future. We're going to be predicting in the future. So then my error step et, let me sub that in. Right here though, et is equal to x at t minus x hat. Observe minus predicted, the standard definition of error. So subbing the et, I will get the following relationship. So et is x t <coughs> minus x hat of t. Substitute that in and simplify. We get this very important <coughs> over here, x hat t plus 1 is equal to lambda x of t plus 1 minus lambda and this is what I want to, to spend some time looking at. It says my prediction one step ahead in the future has got two components to it. It's got a component based on my raw data, and it's got a component based on my predictions in the past. That's the key part there, or historical data. Okay, so my prediction one step ahead of whatever value I measure or of interest to me is <coughs> fraction lambda, the value between 0 and 1, multiplied by my raw data. Then the complementary part is 1 minus lambda. So Lambda is a value between 0 and 1, so if lambda was 0.3, for example, I'm giving 30% weight to my raw data and 70% weight to my historical data. And so always the lambdas, the, these two weights here on the two respective terms will sum up to 1. So lambda and 1 minus lambda. So I, whatever I, weight I give to my raw data, I give the rest of the weight to my historical data, my historical prediction. Now I'd like to show you how, how we can use this to, to get our one step in a prediction. So then you can see in a formula term, I'm getting a prediction of x one step ahead based on my raw data. But let's actually go and implement this okay. with an example. So this is really, really important to understand what's going on in this example. <coughs> I'm going to have my column of t with my raw time step. <coughs> then here I'm going to have my EWMA, which is x hat at t. So I'm just going to rewrite that formula that's over there. EWMA is lambda times x of t. So it's easy to interpret what's going on here 
when I'm writing it in terms of x of t, but to actually use the formula, I use the formula, simply just back shift every one of these one step backwards. So I'm going to use x of t minus 1, and x hat of t minus 1. And so the result that I'm predicting is x hat of t. So this is WMA. Time step one, let's recall that the formula we had up here. So to, to get things going, we have to have some initiation. X hat at time step zero is my target. The error at time step zero is zero. And X hat at time step one is equal to my target. So at time step one, X hat is equal to my target. And for this process, my target T illustration is going to be good. So X hat and time step one so to get going, just to get started. Then I go to my process and I measure this important variable that I'm interested in monitoring. And let's say it's viscosity, for example. And I measure a value on my process and it's got a value of 52 at time step one. So my error then at time step one in one step into the future of what the next viscosity value is going to be. So currently I've only measured 52, now I'm going to predict one step into the future. Let's use for this example lambda equals 0.5. So sub into this formula there, 0.5 multiplied by x t minus 1. Well my t is right now 2. So x subscript t minus 1 refers to x at one time step ago, which is 52. So 0.5 times 52 plus 1 minus lambda multiplied by x hat one time step ago, which is 50. So x hat 2 is equal to 51. So I've made a prediction one step into the future. Now I go to my process at time two, I measure the sample, and I take, take this observation, and I see, well, my actual viscosity was 47. So the error that I had, E2, is equal to observed minus predicted. 47, I predicted a value of 51. So that's an error by minus four. is gone, and before I go to my process and measure the third sample, I can make a prediction one step ahead into the future again, x hat 3, that's lambda multiplied by the previous x that I had, so x and t minus 1, 
the equivalent at time step three that corresponds to exit at time step two, so it's a value of 47. Plus one minus lambda multiplied by x hat at the previous time step, which is 51. We can see that that we calculate that as a value of 49. And I go to my process, I measure an observation, and I record a value of 53. So then my error here e at time step 3 is observed minus 53 minus, I predicted, 49. So my error this time is plus 4. So this is the procedure you follow. Now it seems like, well, hang on, your predictions aren't really that great. Okay. And that's true, because we're just warming up. We're just starting this one step ahead predictor. As I get more and more data, as I rely more on my historical data in the past, I build up a history, my predictions will become more accurate. So let's take a look at that example here visually. I can go plot these points in blue triangles and plotting the EWMA prediction. So let's take a look at that. My EWMA prediction here is this value of 50. Then I go plot 51 and 49. So 50, 51, and then 49. So there's my blue triangles on my EWMA predictions. The raw data that I've used are the orange dots. Now, we become quite apparent here, let's go on one slide. Uh, I've simply just taken what you have in your notes and I've connected the dots. You can start to see how the blue curve trends ahead of the orange curve. It's predicting one step ahead into the future and it's starting to match the trends of the orange curve. Initially, it's a big jumble over here. The predictions aren't all that great. But as you start to move out into the future, the blue curve is predicting one step ahead the same trends that you're seeing in the orange curve. <coughs> Why is this powerful? Think of a process, for example, like a batch process, where you're getting one data point every couple of hours. Wouldn't it be great if you can predict one step ahead into the future where that batch process is going to be? And, med and predict a very hard to measure property, a property that takes many hours of laboratory time. That's my orange points. It would be great if I can predict one step ahead into the future where my process is headed. I don't need to be spot on. But I certainly want to match at least the trends of knowing how it's going. So this is used a lot in forecasting. It's used by companies to forecast their sales for the next quarter. It's used by, by chemical companies to monitor the trends in the process. And it's a great, great way to smooth your data, but predict ahead into the future. Okay, lambda is arbitrary. How is lambda selected? Typical values of lambda are about 0 0.2, 0 0.4. That's a great starting value for lambda if you have no other information. But can you think of a strategy to select lambda? Think a minute and talk to the person next to you. How would you go about finding a better lambda other than just guessing and checking and trial and error? Yeah. 
think I look at it and use different randoms and see what how your uh, <coughs> DWMA performs essentially on that type of data. Okay, so use the DWMA predictions on historical data and see how it performs and alter lambda to get better performance. Anything else along those lines? That's exactly what, how we do to select land optimally. You see these errors that we've built up over here in this error column? You would accumulate this in a spreadsheet in Excel. You've got a column of errors. And you can simply write a little solver routine that says, minimize the sum of squares of those errors by varying lambda. And you, you just simply set a constraint in solver that lambda must be between 0 and 1. It's a very highly nonlinear program. You can easily do it in GAN, you can do it in MATLAB, you can do it in Excel. But good initial guesses for lambda are around 0 0.2, 0.4, and you can find an optimal lambda for your process. Okay? So we can show derivations that this is the optimal one step ahead predictor. There's no other predictor that does as good as the EWMA. So it's a good <coughs> predictor to know. It's a great, great way to monitor a process as well. Let's take a look at how we can monitor a process with EWMA. One thing. Let's perhaps uh, just jump ahead here a few slides and then I'll come back to what I had earlier. Let's, let's take this as an example of my raw data, my process. If I put that raw data through an EWMA and I use lambda equals 0.8, these are the trends I get. So it looks pretty much the same as my raw data. So lambda with 0.8 looks quite similar to my raw data. No surprise, lambda 0.8 over here implies I'm only giving 20% weight to my historical data. So my current prediction one step into the future is mostly a function of the raw data. 80% of my prediction comes from the raw data. So what I'm, what I'm plotting here on this axis is x hat t plus 1. So you may want to add that to your notes. What, what's plotted there on the y axis is x hat t plus 1. For either way, we, we show the predictions one step in the future. So I'm saying 80% of the, my predictions come due to the raw data. If I move that lambda down, now you notice how the curves or the lines here are quite, quite noisy. That, some of that noise goes away. I'm filtering out some of that noise. I'm smoothing out my data. I'm giving a bit more weight to my historical values. And you start to see some of the trends become more and more apparent. So there's this rising trend and then fall off again. You can see that more clearly over here. If we move one on and we go to a very high, a very small lambda, 0.1. So now I'm giving only 10% weight to my raw data and 90 to my historical data. I get a very, very smooth plot. And I start to see these three, three up and down trends and then that very strong rising trend. If we go back to my previous slide, those three trends, they're a little bit apparent over there a little bit apparent over there, but they're showing more clearly now or being smoothed out more clearly in the EWMA. One thing we can show is that as lambda tends to zero, essentially the EWMA chart becomes a QC chart. So as lambda becomes zero or tends to zero, it says I'm giving far, far more <coughs> weight to my historical data. That's exactly what a QSIM chart was. A QSIM chart is a chart that gives equal weight to every point from now all the way back in history to when you start the process. So it's, a QSIM chart is a chart that does exactly that. It gives infinite or all the weight to the historical data. So lambda tending to zero behaves exactly like a QSIM chart. Smooths it out and, and will follow exactly the same trends as a QSIM. Lambda close to 1 behaves like a shoe watch. Okay. So this is why the EWMA chart is a great monitoring tool. Because you can get the benefits of a shoe watch chart and the benefits of a Houston chart with one single chart, with EWMA and careful selection of what your lambda value is. You can make that chart behave in either way. So if you want more qsim like behavior, drop your lambda value down. And so a great, great monitoring chart to, to use. And the limits for the upper and lower control limits are very straightforward for an EWMA chart. 
take your x double bar and add plus or minus three times the following value. You add, take your, your sigma from your Schuh chart and you multiply it by that back to the given infinity squared with lambda over two minus lambda. Sigma Schuh is the same sigma that you would have used on an ordinary Schuh chart, which is s bar over a such a thing. So that's the usual three standard deviations up and down you would have used in the Schuh chart. Sub that in over there and then just add this additional factor. <coughs> Okay, so the EWMA chart can work just as fine as the Chevron chart. All that you do is you simply change your limits a little bit. Okay. So a nice implementation is where you can superimpose the Schuart and EWMA charts. Some, some companies do that. You get the Schuart, regular monitoring, and you get that benefit of the one step ahead prediction of slowly. One other thing just to finally talk about, um, and this is not in your slides, but it is available on the website now if you want to print it out. This is more for 600 level students, is to recognize that we can rewrite that EWMA equation, which is a recursive equation. I can sub one, 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 one x hat t minus one into the next, into the next, into the next, and I can get this expanding recursive equation like as shown here. What you see there is we're giving a weight of lambda to one, one step in my, my raw data. One step back in time, I'm giving a weight of lambda one minus lambda, then lambda one minus lambda squared, lambda one minus lambda cubed. So I've summed in a few values here to, to, be, to get a feel of what those weights look like. If lambda was chosen to be 0.6, in other words, we're giving a lot of weights to my raw data, those weights are 0 0.6, 0 0.24, 0 0.096, 0 0.03. Look how very quickly I'm giving almost no weight to data about three or four time steps in the class. So high landers weight your recent data far more heavily. Low landers, we said, behave more like a Houston chart. You're giving a lot of weight to your historical data. So if we take a look at the point two example, my weights are now point two, point one six, point one two, point one oh two four. They're declining much, much slower than the, the previous. Okay. So. Here's a general rule of thumb. Lambda tending to zero, you get a smoother chart, Houston-like behavior. Lambda tending to one, you get a Shula-like behavior. Okay, so well, in the next assignment, we'll have a question where you can try out a Shula chart. You can go through that derivation over there and, um, and plot, plot one up for yourself. It's, it's, it's a very straightforward chart, easy to use. Now, there are a few other monitoring charts to be aware of. We don't cover these all. Once you understand the principle of monitoring charts in general, all that goes on for these other variations are simply just a different equation underlying them. So there's a very interesting chart called an S chart that monitors the variance of a process. Sometimes monitoring the location of a process is important, but many times monitoring how much the process is varying around that average is critical as well. So this critical in process is where you want to create a very constant product with very little variability. And I'll show an example of that next. Um, one other final chart to talk about is there's an exponentially weighted moving variance chart. So same idea as the S chart which monitors variance. Well, let's monitor it in the declining, exponentially declining rates. Okay, so that's I'd like to talk about something that we really, really need to understand. Unfortunately, when this topic is presented in most universities, when I look at their statistics notes, statistics for engineers, they do not cover multivariate monitoring. So let's recognize that most of the processes you'll be dealing with, you do not collect one variable, you collect multiple variables. How do, we, how do we work with that? Let's take a look and just get an idea of how one can do that. Here's an example of a company that measures the spectral wavelength at multiple observations. So you're all familiar with near infrared spectra. You, you've probably seen them or used them in the chemistry labs, where you get, for every wavelength, you can capture the absorbance. So here's one line that bottom line that captures the spectra 
for one sample. So I can, for example, I put a piece of solid material under the NIR probe, and I'll record that those 650 data points from lowest wavelength to highest wavelength is 650 observations for one sample. So up to now, our monitoring processes have assumed I've got one sample, one value per sample. Now we're going to explode our data set. And this is the problem we're facing as engineers these days. One sample put under my DNA correct probe is not going to be one value. I'm going to get 650 values. How the heck do I deal with it? I don't go build 650 monitoring trials. One thing that companies do is they say, okay, well, there's one or two key wavelengths that are important to me. So they go build a monitoring chart at one wavelength. But then you're throwing away 649 other data points and just ignoring it. Right? What if there's something at one of the other wavelengths that's really interesting for you and that actually monitors the quality of the that, that one wavelength you happen to select? Okay, so we, we, there are tools available where we take these 650 values and we compress them down in a meaningful way to one number and then we monitor that single value. So most of the modern monitoring systems we deal with follow the <coughs> procedure where we take a very large amount of raw data, and here we're talking about over one megabyte typically per sample, and we then reduce it down to a single number. And then that single number goes into my monitoring system. And you can monitor that with EWMA, Shuat, or whichever method you pick. But the key is compress that raw data down to a single number. And the, that compression can be done in several ways. It can be done by least squares. Sometimes it's simply as, as simple as taking the sum of squares of every value over there. Uh, you can use more sophisticated tools like PCA, PLS, and we'll talk about those two tools at the end of this course, PCA and PLS. The key thing to recognize is don't throw away all that raw data. Use it in some way and compress it down sensibly down to a single number. And let's be clear here, this is not a single step in many cases. There's often multiple steps to get down to that single number. But most companies will naively throw away all the data and just put one way around. Don't do that. There are intelligent ways of dealing with this problem. Here's another one that I had uh, the uh, I'll talk a bit more about the example next, but to understand the context, let's take a look at image data. Image data, if you take a photo with your, with your cell phone camera or digital camera, what you're collecting essentially is a three-dimensional matrix of data, of numbers. Those data are presented in the following way. You've got the XY axis of whatever you're taking the photo of, and then you've got a number of wavelengths. So typically, you've got red, green, and blue for your digital camera. If you're the federal government, those number of wavelengths are fairly large. They can be 128. So all the satellites that we have out above the Earth. In the 1980s, the US revealed in, in their classified documents that they have satellites out there that are uh, taking images of the Earth at 128 wavelengths. So they use all the near infrared and no ultraviolet wavelengths. They can use it very effectively to predict the health of crops and forests and monitor the Earth. So in many cases, those number of wavelengths are large. And each picture here is easily 5, 10 megabytes per photo. Great source of data, great source of, to monitor. Especially useful in our industries where we're dealing with solids. For those of you that work with liquids and gases, we've got easy data. Flows, compositions, temperatures. Easy, easy to measure. But if you're working with solids, it's very, very difficult to measure properties of solids. But it's great to take a photo of the solids. Kind of simple. 
So many industrial cameras are extremely cheap and can be used to take photos of solid products. Medical imaging is another way to take photos of solids. Let's compress that data down to a single number and then monitor. So here's an example that I, I, I worked with um, Honglu, a PhD student here a few years ago. She developed this monitoring system for DuPont. They burn waste fuel. So liquid fuel is coming into this boiler. Now one problem with liquid fuel is that it does not have the same energy content. So depending on what's, what, what that waste fuel is, it could have a low energy content or a high energy content, but the company doesn't know. They simply accept it and they burn it. So to supplement that, they add a natural gas stream, and those two combined are burned to generate the steam. So steam is required on the plant at a certain flow, at a certain demand, but you have this uncertainty in the energy content of your liquid fuel. You cannot measure energy content online. What you can very easily do is you can take a photo of the flame. That video of the flame is very, very strongly related to the energy content of the fuel. So she developed techniques in her PhD thesis to analyze this video of flame and make a prediction of the energy content. So in milliseconds, you can predict what that liquid fuel's waste stream energy content is. And if it's not high enough, you can open the valve on the natural gas line to supplement it to get it to the desired energy content. So you can create a feedback control loop that keeps your flame at the right level of energy intensity by combining one variable stream of, of liquid fuel and the constant natural gas energy content. Another monitoring system that she developed was for uh, solids monitoring. This is a uh, Dorito snack food. So she developed the technique um, a few years ago. I helped write the software and this is now running many cameras across uh, Frito Lake. What they do is they measure the seasoning content of snack food in real time as follows. They take a digital image, so here's an image with no seasoning, and it's got a greenish tinge just because these are old photos that weren't color balanced correctly. And then up here is the, the familiar final Doritos product that you're used to seeing. Okay, so low seasoning on the left, high seasoning on the right. And what she did is, it's a very straightforward step of called creating a score space. It's essentially this step here, it's called PCA or a fancy way of saying that if you do the eigen composition, so all that linear algebra that you've kind of forgotten from the second year, is extremely useful on image data to create what's called the score space. And in the score space, you can very quickly find directions which correlate very strongly with the seasoning. So a photo of uncoated snack food will show up over here, and a photo of coated snack food Sufficient seasoning shows up there, and others are all in two. So she developed an Instagram tool. So she started from an image, which is about one megabyte in size, down to 32 bins. So she's gone from, here's essentially about a million data points, down to 32 data points, using the IBM composition and getting an histogram. And then the next step was to do a PLS, so we talked about PLS in the next class, so essentially you can see that as a linear regression, where you take those 32 values down to one number. And the number she was predicting was what the laboratory was predicting. So periodically Frito-Lay goes to the process, grabs a handful of snacks, crushes it up, and measures the laboratory test to predict what the seasoning level is, and they check that that's correct. The problem was that they do that only every eight hours. So if between the last grab of sample and the next one, they recognize the seasoning was too low or too high, there's a lot of volume of product that needs to be reworked or scrapped or blended out. So the beauty of the system is that you can have an online camera running every five seconds taking a photo, calculating a prediction of what that seasoning is. So here's what Frito-Lay does right now. They take these snack foods, and they digitize the image, and for every little cube over here, they predict the average seasoning in that square. So there's the seasoning in that square, the seasoning in that square. And you can go to smaller and smaller grids. So here's essentially what they, the grid that they use. And 
what this does is, this picture was actually unofficially created. It's, here's your regular Doritos, and Hong Lu threw a handful of uncoded Doritos on top of it. So the blue, dot, blue pixels represent totally uncoded products, and the red pixels represent fully coded products. So what this comes to, what FreeWay does now, is they monitor the seasoning level, the average seasoning level, and they monitor the variance of the seasoning level to make sure that the product is stable, that you've got the right amount of seasoning, but also that you don't have some snacks with too much seasoning and other snacks with too little seasoning. No one likes, <coughs> likes that. You grab into a bag of Doritos and you've got some that are uncoated and some that are overcoated. The average is okay, but the variance is too high. So that's not desirable either. So Freeway has actually taken that a step further. Instead of just monitoring the average, they put it under feedback control. So they've now got a feedback controller that correctly adds the right amount of seasoning in real time. So this is a nice example because it illustrates monitoring and it illustrates the effective use of larger quantities of data. So this process of going from high volumes of raw data down to a single number, often a multi-step process, but one thing I want you to remember is don't throw away your data. You can do very, very interesting things like that. It may take a bit more work than normal, but there's a lot of value in that large, large amount of data. One final example I want to consider, and then I'll come back to some of these slides that's going to go over the next class, is right here in Hamilton, the former DeFasco, now Arsenal Mita. In terms of technology, they are probably one of the world leaders in terms of applying these multivariate data tools. Um, one example that I can show here, they've, they've given us these slides to use in for our classes uh, because John McGregor and some of his grad students helped develop the system. It's a, a, a multivariate monitoring system. So let's take a look at that. Here's uh, inside of, of the company. Um, so they, they have a molten metal in that tun dish over here. They live on it. For scale, there's two, two operators over there. And that molten metal, it, it comes by, it swings around, and it, it comes into this part where it starts to, to get extruded. So here's another slide on that to show you that. So that tun dish swings into place, and they extrude these slabs. Those slabs are then go out on the conveyor belt, and they cool naturally. So there's a bit of water cooling upstream here, but once they come out of these roller bars, they're just simply left to cool naturally. The problem is if they extrude too fast, then our portions on the outer shell here that do not solidify. So if you extrude too quickly, then it can be regions that form that are not totally solidified. And will lead to a very hazardous situation called a breakup. So there's a corner of one of the, the areas that's opened up, molten metal spills on the ground, it's a hazard to the operators, it's a hazard uh, to, the, uh, to jamming up that conveyor belt. So breakouts cost a lot of money to clean up and then get going again. option the operators have available to them to prevent a breakout is to slow down the speed at which they cast. So I can always create successful slabs if I cast extremely slowly. The problem is then I suffer a backlog. I cannot beat my production schedule. So it's a very, very classic example of a company that's working on that fine line where we go too fast, we get a negative outcome, we go too slow, you get a negative value. There's an optimum somewhere in between that you want to strike for. So what they've done here is they've taken data on their process, multiple temperatures. So as this as this slab is going over here, there's a very, very high number of sensors along here that measure temperatures. Those temperatures are fed into a finite difference, uh, finite element model of the cooling process. So those partial differential equations are solved and integrated to estimate what the rate of cooling is on the process at the current casting speed. So casting speed is a variable, temperatures are a variable, the current rate of steel that they're extruding is a variable. 
all of those go in and create what they've called two stability indexes. Stability index one, stability index two. And as long as these stability index in the seats are below their monitoring so this is a one-sided monitoring chart. It's one side. The, the lowest value you get is zero in front of the that. That's just the way the index is designed. So the operators will pass and increase the passing speed as long as they remain below that stability index of one, they're okay. If they go above that stability index, so here's a situation where they've gone over one, the current value is about one point or two, it throws up the alarm, so the monitoring chart turns red, and it tells them which of the variables in the process are the most different to their regular <coughs> levels. So here they can see that these thermocouples, upper, loose upper one thermocouple, loose lower six thermocouple, that means something to them. They can then go and diagnose them if they want to later on. But the most immediate thing that they can do and change is to simply slow down, back off to the lower plastic and then go and figure out what it is that's gone wrong with that position. So, very successful monitoring system. The amount of sophistication behind those calculations, I can't even begin to describe because it's a whole graduate course on latent variable methods and, and uh, the, the integration of all those equations coming together to create very simple monitoring charts. So the operators have no idea of the mathematical complexity behind it. All that they need to know is be aware of the stability in the system. To put it in perspective, the company implemented that in 97. It's gone through several revisions that that the system. They reckon they say more than a million dollars a year. It's going to be to rate up plus about 200000 to $500,000 to fix. Um, that system is more than paid for itself. So if you look back to 97 and prior, they were averaging about 12 break outs per year. So it's about six to six to ten million dollars just on the cost of break outs. So the fact now that they're producing close to zero, so this is the last day was in 2006, uh, just verbal discussions with them is that that number was pretty much zero or one per year. So the system more than pay for itself, but the other way the system pay for itself is that they now increase their cost of speed. So the production schedule is very much accelerated. So those additional costs just from monitoring alone. Okay, so next class what we'll do is we'll just take a look at this monitoring and we'll talk about 